My name is Michal Žižlavský, I'm the press uh, attaché here at the embassy. And here on my left is uh, Dr. Jakub Beneš, uh, an associate professor at the UCL, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. With an awfully typical Czech name, he comes originally from Oakland, California. And Jakub specializes on the history of Central and Eastern Europe, especially the former countries of the Habsburg monarchy. He is uh, of a Czech descent, and his grandfather, Vladimir Hodek, was a close associate of Jan Masaryk up until his tragic death. Then we have Dr. Thomas Lorman, who is a lecturer at the UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies in London, and he focuses on the history of Central Europe and is currently working on a study of politics in the Habsburg monarchy and the interwar Czechoslovakia. Last but not least, uh, we have an unexpected a member of our panel, Mr. Martin Josten, who is the son of Josef Josten, former journalist and political agitator, who served as Jan Masaryk's press speaker in the years of 1947 and 1948. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, panel, and I would like to ask you for an applause to welcome them. So I would like to introduce uh, our panel or introduce our discussion by a short overview of Jan Masaryk's life. Jan Masaryk was born into the family of the future first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomáš Karik Masaryk, on 1886 in what was then uh, the Austria Hungary. He was not a very good student and he didn't even finish high school. And instead, he decided to move to the US where he worked at unqualified jobs and he played piano in clubs during the evenings. He served on the Italian front during the Great War in the Austro-Hungarian army. And after the creation of Czechoslovakia, he joined the foreign service of the newly created state. First, as a charge d'affaires in Washington, then as personal secretary of then Foreign Minister Dr. Edward Benesch, and from 1921 as diplomat, and from 1925 to 1938 as Czechoslovak ambassador to London. With 13 years at this position, he remains our longest serving ambassador in London and probably anywhere else in the world until today. After the tragic Munich Agreement in September 1938, which he didn't manage to stop, he left the foreign service, but later joined the exiled government of uh, the president uh, Edward Benesch as the Czechoslovak foreign minister. And he was keeping the spirit of Czechoslovaks by his regular broadcast, Vola London, London Calling, uh, that he did for the BBC. After the war, he became the foreign minister in liberated Czechoslovakia, which he remained even after the 1948 communist coup up until his tragic death on March, 9th, uh, March 10th, 1948. So uh, I will start the debate uh, by addressing Jakub with my question, uh, what do you think was Jan Masaryk's main goal as an ambassador to the UK in the 1920s and 1930s? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Michal, for, for having me at this, this really exciting and, and important event. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on Jan Masaryk, but I, I work on the period, like, like my colleague Tom, and, and as you mentioned, I, I have a, a somewhat personal insight into, into Masaryk's um, uh, career and, and his, his, uh, his uh, deeds as, as ambassador and then as foreign minister um, through my, my, my grandfather, who knew him well. And so actually later on, maybe in the debate, I, I can read a little bit, uh, a couple sections perhaps of my grandfather's uh, description of his last meeting with Jan Masaryk, which was on the 8th of March, 1948. So uh, the day actually before uh, he died, he met with him for, for three hours. So it might have, he might have been the last person to have a long personal meeting with him. Um, <clears throat> we don't actually know whether he died on the night of the 9th or the morning of the 10th. Uh, but very, very uh, uh, soon before um, uh, uh, his, his tragic demise. When Jan Masaryk came to London in 1925 as ambassador, he was very concerned uh, from the beginning to combat what he thought was the spirit of the Habsburg monarchy lingering in British 
uh, public opinion and especially in British political and diplomatic circles. Uh, Czechoslovakia was created with uh, the support of the British government at the end of the First World War, uh, but the British uh, soon fell out of love with the Czechoslovaks and they regretted uh, what they had done or what they thought they had done to the Germans uh, at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Uh, and so they, um, there was, from the early 1920s really, a sense that Britain had made a mistake in giving so much power or creating such a large Czechoslovakia with so many minorities in, the, in it, particularly the Germans. Uh, they resented um, uh, France, their, their main ally, uh, the, the, the conduct of France at the Paris Peace Conference, which was uh, kind of uh, sort of single-mindedly devoted towards or, or driven by the thought of revenge against Germany and France's desire to have a strong kind of block of anti-German states um, in, in Eastern Europe. And the British thought that they had given far too much to their French allies in 1919. So, Jan Masaryk was aware of this when he takes up his, his post in, in London in, in 1925. Uh, and he, um, and Czechoslovakia, in fact, um, declines in sort of British public opinion over the course of the, of the interwar period. However, Jan Masaryk was one of the few bright spots, really, in, in Czechoslovakia's relations with Britain in this period, because Jan Masaryk was was very highly esteemed by the British political class uh, and, and diplomatic circles. Uh, unlike, unlike Foreign Minister and later President Edvard Benesch, to whom I'm not related, um, who uh, annoyed the British quite a bit, it seems, or, or leading figures in, in the British government. Already at the end of the First World War, uh, the, the, the then Prime Minister uh, Lloyd George had referred to, to, to Benesch as the little French jackal because uh, Benesch, he, he spoke French better than he spoke English. He had spent m much of the war years in, in France, and, and, and he seemed a kind of um, sort of Czechoslovak sidekick of, of, the, of, of Clemenceau and, and, and the French who were, who were uh, getting on, on Lloyd George's nerves um, increasingly. And, and Benesch had a very kind of, Benesch, as, as a, as a um, politician, was, he was a very intelligent, very driven, uh, very principled, uh, extremely persistent to the point of being dogged and, and um, didn't really, didn't really, um, uh, didn't always ingratiate himself to, to kind of um, British uh, political circles or, or really comprehend kind of um, English kind of um, uh, manners, let's say. Whereas Jan Masaryk did, and Jan Masaryk was very, um, very, refined and, and witty, and uh, he, um, according to my grandfather, he often told people in Britain that they shouldn't be afraid of Czechoslovakia, that it's, uh, that it's not an infectious disease, as it might sound. It's actually a country in, 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 in East Central Europe, uh, and, and other things like that. So, so Jan Masaryk was, was really good at sort of putting his, his British interlocutors at ease and, and, um, and also speaking to them in a way that um, well, he, he, it must be said that he had more experience with America and he spoke more in, in an American accent and somehow, and sometimes he came across as a little too direct for, for British, uh, for, for his um, uh, uh, contacts here, but they, they, they appreciated his, his, his wit, his irony and his um, intelligence very much. And so that, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it for there, there right now. That, that was a real bright spot in, in um, uh, Czechoslovakia's uh, relations with, with uh, um, uh, Britain in the interwar period. Um, I, I can actually say more, but maybe we should move on to another question. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot about what we're talking in the movie as well, so we don't want to spoil everything, of course. So I would now ask Tom, uh, let's move to the, the post-Munich agreement uh, period. How would you assess Masaryk's role then? How did it change? How did his uh, behavior change. What do you think about that? Thank you, and, uh, and let me echo Jakob's uh, uh, words of appreciation for being here, joining this panel. It's very good to, to be here. Uh, it's a good question. Obviously, 
uh, in the immediate aftermath of, of Munich, uh, he was clearly tremendously wounded by a, both a, a perceived sense that he had failed to make the case for Czechoslovakia, and that Britain, by endorsing the Munich Agreement, had betrayed his own belief in this country. Mm -hmm. And there must have been, in fact, we know from, from, from eyewitnesses, there was a particularly tragic moment where the new government that emerged after Munich in the brief period when, um, when Czechoslovakia was essentially uh, subordinated to, 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 to Nazi Germany, uh, required him to remove <coughs> the picture of his father from, uh, from the embassy where, where the picture was, was hung in his honour, and he took down the picture himself and apparently without saying a word, and then went to America to give a, to give a tour. So, but, uh, but what's remarkable about him, and I think this is the point that I want to underscore, is that uh, historians have often written about Jan Masaryk as, a, as, a, as almost a tragic figure. I mean, a, he failed to, in spite of his skills and effort to, to make the case for Czechoslovakia uh, in Britain, uh, uh, and which led to Munich. Uh, after Munich, when he returned here to, to fight for a free Czechoslovakia in a free Europe, which was his words, uh, he, he failed to, to prevent uh, Benes, the former head of the Czechoslovak government, in exile from, from adopting an increasingly pro-Soviet line. And then, of course, uh, after 1945, uh, he ultimately failed to prevent the full communist takeover of Czechoslovakia, uh, which culminated in 1948. And so historians present him often as tragic, well-meaning, uh, possessing many qualities, but ultimately a tragic failure. Uh, and yet, to me, um, actually, he was part of a remarkable success story because he turned that absolute moment of tragedy in 39, 38, uh, into uh, a remarkable turnaround in British attitudes to Czechoslovakia, where the British not only recognized uh, a Czechoslovak government in exile as a legitimate uh, uh, representative of the Czechoslovak people, but even by 1942, and it took three years of lobbying, the British government formally admitted that Munich had been a mistake. And getting the British government to admit that it made a mistake, not always an easy, easy policy. And, um, and I think my, my explanation for this, if I just briefly say it, that we may come back to this, is that Masaryk is not a tragic figure. Uh, he was someone who achieved successes, fought hard for what he believed in, and I think actually was a foremost exponent and perhaps the last exponent uh, of a generation uh, of Czechs and Slovaks who believed in the muscular liberalism of his father, uh, Tomáš Masaryk, <coughs> who had, in the First World War, done exactly the same as his son did in the Second World War. Making, taking an impossible situation as it appeared in 1914 and persuading the British to change their minds. Uh, so I see him as a, as a figure who responded to the tragedy of 38-39 uh, by drawing on, I think, uh, both explicitly and implicitly, the lesson that his father had showed him, which is that there is a way of coming out of adversity to turn tragedy into success. Thank you. So we talked about the broadcast that uh, Masaryk did uh, with the BBC, uh, Vola London, London is calling. Uh, Martin, could you tell us more about it? What was the purpose of it? And what was uh, the role of Czech journalists as Eric Auerbach or, or Yuzi Mucha, the, father, uh, the, the son of Alphonse Mucha, or your father, Josef Josten, with relation to the broadcast? 
Thank you. Um, yes, I'm quite honoured to be sitting here next to two very well qualified historians, and I'm not a historian, I'm simply the son of a journalist. But it's, uh, it's nice to be able to, uh, to talk with you. Um, the, the, the broadcasts during the war were actually documented by a photographer called Erich Auerbach, and his documentation is down on the table. You can look at it afterwards, uh, a book called Vola Londin. Um, Erich Auerbach actually started life as a musician, but he um, eventually decided he could make photography and journalism his profession and music his, his hobby. But he, he became, after working for a number of uh, Czech newspapers before the war, um, he, he escaped and he became the official photographer of the government in exile. So he followed Masaryk and Benish around taking photographs of their uh, activities. So that leads us to what the point was of all this activity. Well, um, I'm willing to be corrected on the details, but as I understand it, some of the challenges that Jan Masaryk had um, were to raise the morale of his people at home and of those escapees who were fighting with British forces. So using the media was absolutely key. He wanted to get certain messages across to the masses of Czechs and, and of course, other nations about Czech interests and, and to keep their morale up. Um, and for this, he, he had a, a, an information department. Um, and my father, for example, Josef Jostin, was employed um, by that department, but also uh, as a member of the Czech army, he seemed to sort of shuttle between the two, and he was um, uh, seconded in the latter part of the war to the BBC offices in, in London, where he was working very closely with Jan Masaryk to make sure that the right messages were put out at the right time. Um, and meanwhile, there were other Czech journalists also working for him, uh, or working for the BBC. So Yuzi Mucha, the son of Alphonse Mucha, was actually the BBC, uh, one of their war correspondents. And I don't have much detail about his interactions with the Czech government, but I'm quite sure that he uh, was in constant communication with them to make sure that his broadcasts were in, in Czech interests. And maybe some of my colleagues here know something more about that. Thank you very much. So I have one last question that I would like to ask all of you and before we uh, give the floor to the audience because we didn't invite you just to look but also to ask. <laughs> when Jan Masaryk returned to the liberated Czechoslovakia, he became uh, the foreign minister and he really had the hard time of being the foreign minister in the time where the country was slowly being taken over by the communists. There was a strong influence of the Soviets who saw our country as sort of a war trophy. How do you assess uh, this period of Masaryk's life, his role in it, and uh, what do you think about his tragical death? That's the big question, isn't it? Um, well, I, I think that uh, I think that Jan Masaryk was actually a tragic figure in this in this respect because uh, he, like Benesh, uh, President Benesh, was was committed uh, and was very preoccupied with um, with the danger that Germany posed even after its defeat in 1945. And uh, he, like Benesh, was was worried about German revanchism and, and, and Germany maybe even uh, trying to claim back uh, the Sudetenland. And so he was willing to, um, he was willing to uh, go, along more, go along with, uh, or make more concessions to the Soviet Union maybe than he should have at the time, or maybe than was advisable. Although he wasn't naive at all, and he knew, he knew what, what the Soviets were about. Um, but he, believed very strongly that, that um, Czechoslovakia needed, needed to be defended against 
the possibility of a German revival, and uh, the Soviet Union provided that. And it was also it was also a question of um, uh, his his disillusionment. Um, well, I mean, he was as I said, he was cynical about. Uh, or he, he was skeptical about the Soviet Union, but he was increasingly disillusioned with uh, the United States and, and the West from 1946 on because the United States was not going to give loans and uh, uh, an aid. They need, Czechoslovakia, he wanted to request, he actually, Jan Masaryk requested grain deliveries in early 1947. From, tried to request from Truman and, and requested from George Marshall, Secretary of State. Uh, and that was not going to happen because Czechoslovakia, uh, because uh, the communists had done so well in the 1946 elections. And uh, the United States was a bit worried about where this would go. Then Masaryk, he, he strongly believed that Czechoslovakia could still be between East and West, between the Soviet Union and, and the West, the United States, he wanted to take, he wanted to lead the Czechoslovak delegation to the 1947 meeting in Paris where the initial plans for the Marshall Plan would be discussed. Stalin told him and a couple others in no uncertain terms, it, uh, I think it was Gottwald and Prokop Durkina that they would not be able to go to, to, to Paris. Uh, and so already by the end of 1947, um, Masaryk was very, very disillusioned, uh, both with their Soviet ally and with uh, the West. And so I think, um, I think that is what led to his demise. Certainly that's how my, my grandfather saw it, but um, we could get to that. Yeah. Maybe can you read us? Oh yes, well, um, I don't know how, yeah, well, it's very long, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit, give you a little bit of a um, snapshot here. So he, he um, so my grandfather uh, was working for the, the embassy of Czechoslovakia in the United States, and he came back in, in late February 1948 because um, things were obviously in, in motion and they didn't have reliable news, so he went to look for, for himself, and, and he had known Jan Masaryk since before the Second World War. Uh, he had um, actually been part of Jan Masaryk's campaign against Sudeten propaganda, Sudeten German propaganda before the Second World War. Um, as a sort of intern, my grandfather was there in 1937 and 38 as an intern to improve his English. Um, Jan Masaryk arranged for him to go on a speaking tour and explain to the British public what uh, was actually happening in the Sudetenland, which was radicalization, the rise of Nazism. And uh, he became quite good friends with my grandfather then. And then at this point, he, he meets him again just before his, his, his death. And uh, they have this long meeting, which my grandfather then recorded. And he, uh, he, he basically, two, two things are worth mentioning. First, his despair at Czechoslovakia's untenable international situation. And, and he, says, he says, quote, yes, I am a member of the new government. I repeat it again that I joined it voluntarily. Nobody forced me to. I don't deny that there are reservations and doubts on my part. There are considerable differences of opinion between myself and other members of the government. They know that as well as I do. However, I am of the opinion, opinion that I can make my views better felt within the government than from without. Many as my reservations may be, I'm sure of one thing, that this Gottwald government would protect Czechoslovakia against the German expansion just as much as the previous ones did. Uh, and then he ruminated at length on, on uh, sort of Soviet um, Machiavellianism and also kind of American ignorance at the, the difficulty that Czechoslovakia found itself in, even though he loved America. He says, I am, I am being talked of as half America. It is true, uh, half American. It is true, and I am proud of it. I love that big and great country. Until not long ago, I thought I understood it well. Now I have some difficulty in doing so. It is clear to everybody that it is not easy to co cooperate with Russia, yet it is not equally clear as to where the present American policy is leading. And then the real, um, the real uh, sort of reflection of his despair came when uh, he talked to my grandfather about the notes he had received from, or the, the press that he had been exposed to and the notes he had received from his former friends in the West, kind of criticizing him for staying in the government. 
Uh, so he, um, he said at this point, uh, this is what my grandfather wrote about 48 hours after he found out about his, his death. Um, he, he wrote, uh, he said, they are telling, me, telling us that by taking part in the new government, I betrayed the legacy of my father, that I betrayed all the ideals of democracy and humanity, which I had stood for and defended all my life. They are unable to understand how after February and all that happened, I can associate my name with the new government and cooperate with the communists. They have accused me that together with Benesh, I helped sell Czechoslovakia out to Russia. Look at those cables over there. Some of them even publicly renounced their friendship with me. So at the end, he, he was isolated from the West that he loved um, and from many of his contacts in, in Britain. And I think that was really uh, the tragedy that he, that he found himself in uh, at the end of his life. Uh, thank you. Um, it, history, and particularly the history of Central and Eastern Europe, is, I find, fascinating because the debates there are starker than one finds in other countries, I think, at least in Europe. And this particular period, 45 to 48, is one which historians have been endlessly arguing over, uh, and not just historians, of course, I think every Czech uh, has a view. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes uh, debated over the kitchen table uh, about what happened. Uh, and I think there are two uh, key lines of thought here. Uh, one is that uh, the situation was frankly impossible and, uh, and uh, could not be stopped. Uh, uh, the, the, the odds, the weight, the force uh, of, of Sovietization was irresistible. And I think we need to bear that into account rather than making judgments, particularly judgments which are grounded in, in, in the 2020 vision of hindsight. On the other hand, there is an argument uh, which is equally strongly made that the presence of Soviet troops, for example, in Czechoslovakia was a necessary condition for the Sovietization and a takeover, but not sufficient. That mistakes were made. Uh, naivete played a role. Uh, and that certain uh, attitudes, such as a fear of Germany, perhaps were overplayed, uh, though understandably so, and a, a proper recognition of the bestial nature of Stalinism was underestimated. I, I think that debate is legitimate, and I would simply encourage all of you to, to look into it further, um, because it's what makes history interesting. Um, uh, my own view is that uh, I think I, 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 I change my mind every couple of weeks, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, based on what the latest thing I've read, uh, one day I'll write something myself, but like so much of my other work, I'll change my mind about that as well probably immediately after I published it. Well, there's not very much I can add to what my friends have said, other than that I agree with their comments. There's one or two little anecdotes I can add. Uh, I gather that uh, Thomas Masaryk actually wrote a book about suicide. Maybe you were not aware of that, or no, a did. book or a tract of some sort. Yeah. yeah. No. So that might be significant. Um, another point is that um, Jan Masaryk had various assistants in, in the foreign ministry. He had two private secretaries. Uh, there was a, a Mr. Sum and there was a Mr. Sokup. Uh, Lumia Sokup uh, escaped to the West uh, shortly after my father did and after the coup d'etat. And he and my father, who was the press secretary, um, agreed that they considered he committed suicide. And they thought that the Czech communists would try to blame Masaryk's death on the Russians so that the Czech communists could kind of absolve themselves of his, what you might call his psychological murder. But there we are, that's just one uh, take on the situation. 
I, I recently discovered a book by um, a man called uh, Franciszek Augusta, who was a spy working for, for the Czechs, for the Czech communists in, in this country, and who later defected in the 1970s. And in his book, Red Star Over Prague, there's a copy on the table there, he, he describes uh, preparations for the assassination of Masaryk. So that would be an argument that it was actually a murder. But interestingly enough, he also describes in another part of the book the preparations for the assassination of my own father. So, and my father survived whatever it was. So you can make of that what you will. Thank you. So thank you very much to all of you. I would like to ask for uh, applause for our... With this, I would like to close this part of the panel, and I would like to give uh, the floor to you, our audience, uh, that you can ask uh, about what you're interested to our panelists. We will try to pass you this microphone. I hope it's going to work, but let's see. It hasn't been very cooperative today. So is there any over there? Maybe, maybe can we take two questions to make it a bit more easier? So you and, is there anyone else? Okay, so then over there. I was rather intrigued by Dr. Benesh, uh, the sort of uh, description of the British attitude to the formation of first Czechoslovakia, of, uh, of Czechoslovakia. And I just wondered whether he would actually explain, at least partially, the British attitude at Munich uh, because of what you've just told us, which is quite new to me and I found it very interesting. I know that you touched on Masaryk's death um, and your reasons as to why you thought it was murder or suicide, but I don't think that I got a concise answer. I feel like it was sort of doubled around. Um, so please, each of you, I'd like to know whether you thought it was suicide or whether it was murder. This is why I'm here. <laughs> My God. Well, to the second question, thank you. I think it was suicide. Uh, my grandfather was convinced it was suicide. Most of Masaryk's close friends and relatives thought it was suicide. Um, according to the, the testimony that, that my grandfather wrote, he wrote it in English based on his notes in, in the early 50s in, in American Asylum, and then he published it in, in um, a Czech historical journal in the early 90s. Uh, he presents Masaryk really as a kind of broken man at this point. Uh, and uh, and he, Masaryk is actually kind of musing to himself at one point in this description. Uh, he, he, said, he asks himself suicide, but he says, no, that's not an option, but he was thinking about it. Um, to uh, the question about British attitudes, well, it's, it's, it's a big topic and related to um, Britain's policy of appeasement in, in the 1930s, but that idea that... Uh, Nazi Germany should be accommodated, really, in its geopolitical aims, stemmed from the idea, really, that uh, Germany had been wronged at the Versailles, uh, uh, with the Versailles Treaty at the Paris Peace Conference. And that, that idea was very widespread uh, in the British educated public. Uh, and there were not, the, not that many people at the time who took the opposing view. Um, Churchill was one, Anthony Eden was another, so there were influential voices against appeasement, but there was, there was a British public opinion was very much for it, for peace at all costs, really, and uh, certainly a sense that Germany was closer in some ways than, even under the Nazis, than, than the, the faraway peoples of, of East Central Europe. Um, so I think maybe I'll just leave it there for now. Uh, just, just to add on this, uh, uh, a good biographer, Bruce Lockhart, uh, said about Jan Masaryk uh, 
that uh, there were many young Masaryks. Uh, one of them was always prone to melancholy and depression. And that nobody, he said, knew all of the young Masaryks. And we know that <coughs> between 45 and 1948, he was, and this is, this is consensus across the board, increasingly reclusive, withdrawn, losing much of his vigour. He'd lost uh, both of his nephews, one flying for the British Air Force at the very end of the war, the other from tuberculosis. He had a problematic <laughs> uh, relationship that he was struggling with. And of course, uh, he was acutely aware of the trauma that had been inflicted on his country and the ongoing tragedies that were unfolding with so many of his fellow countrymen. And so um, uh, we know that he, he, he was, to all intents and purposes, increasingly depressed all the way up to his death. And this is why the three inquests uh, which have been held into his death have all concluded that the probability is suicide, uh, the, although the later two, the 68 inquest and, and the post-communist inquest, both said that you can't rule out the possibility of murder. Uh, and uh, quite rightly so, whenever you're dealing with the communists, you can never rule out anything. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but the likelihood is that a deeply depressed man uh, did something that many men do. They in a moment, chose to end their lives, impulsively. Uh, once again, um, I have to say I agree. It was my father's view that it was suicide, and uh, also it was uh, Dr. Sokup's view as his private secretary. But I would like to throw this back to you as the questioner, because I understand that your family have some association with Masaryk, and I believe it would be uh, interesting to the other people here to hear about that, if that yeah, I can do so. so. Um, I strongly believe that uh, he was murdered by the communists. Um, we've got a, an extract from my granddad's biography which said that he was shot in an airfield near Prague and there was a bullet wound in a Masaryk's neck. Mm. I doubt someone would kill himself shooting at a weird angle in the back of the neck. I just think it's rather odd. Um, that was Dr. Tepley's report, the, the guy who did the, autis, um, the autopsy on Masaryk. Mm. It's just a, a strange point, and again, with the position of his body, I found that again quite strange that a man of his size would squeeze out such a tiny bathroom window when the housekeeper would keep the bedroom window open every day. Mm. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, and the, the fact that all the, in, the inquisitions about his death, mostly communist-led. Of course it was going to be suicide, why wouldn't it be? Because it's easier for them to cover up. Mm. Thank you. And maybe I will also add my opinion as a Czech diplomat, as someone who has visited Masaryk's uh, flat, who's seen the window, the lethal weapon, <laughs> several times, and someone who has spent quite some time working in uh, the same building. I would say if you ask a Czech diplomat, maybe we can even ask uh, our deputy ambassador, I would say 95% believe it was a matter. And maybe it wasn't, but uh, it's sort of a, something that's keeping us up working, you know. It's like uh, <laughs> the cheering us up that it was a matter, it was not a suicide. It's increasing our morale. Maybe it's, it's like a myth, you know, that's connected with the building, what we're working at. So I guess we all kind of tend to believe it was, it was a murder. And I think if you ask a, every Czech person, they would all tell you the same. So I will close this on that. And uh, I would uh, do one last round of questions. And uh, then, yeah, over there. If I, if I may some quick reflections on the British attitude before uh, and leading to 38. There's one factor that has not been mentioned, which I'm sure you would understand, which does not uh, justify, but it does explain the strange attitude 
strange aspects of it. Uh, we should remember that most of the prime ministers leading up to 38 and involved in 38, Chamberlain predominantly, had fought in World War I. And we know that Chamberlain never ever forgot the horror that was World War I and simply promised everyone that he would not allow for anything like that to happen again in his lifetime. Now, we can look back and say this is a very naive point of view, a very simplistic point of view, when you have Adolf Hitler on the other end of the line. And we can agree that this was too naive, too simple. But it does explain a little bit why there was this obstinate obsession with pursuing this avoidance as, as far as possible. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to say is nothing to do with that, but just to record as a musician that when Masaryk was in London in May 26, 1926, he was involved in welcoming Janacek, Leos Janacek here, mm. and Janacek even wrote down some things he said to him uh, in music notation. He wrote down Masaryk's voice and the inflections of his voice, mm. and they got on very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirin. Do we have any other questions? Over there, gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that Jan uh, Garrick Masary, because it was his middle name as well, was... Uh, Maybe you can hear me. Um, he, he, um, he was a friend of Churchill, but, uh, and, and he used to speak to him quite often. Um, and uh, the phone calls were being listened to by uh, secret, uh, secret police, MI5, I think. Um, and uh, the conversations were then given to Chamberlain, so Chamberlain didn't like uh, Masaryk at all. And of course Masaryk also had uh, been given money from Banish or from Czech government to um, sponsor um, the public opinion towards, uh, so, so the British opinion would support um, Czech Republic uh, as a whole as opposed to giving away the student land. Um, so I, I, I was just interested, uh, was the American Secret Service or Americans not involved in all these discussions prior to 1938 Munich Conference? So, so that's your question. Yeah. And one, is there anyone else? Last question. If not, I guess we will uh, stay with this. I guess this is a question for you, as you're the... <laughs> Maybe there's one more. Oh, one more there? Okay. Um, why did the British government support um, people leaving Czechoslovakia after the 1938 Munich Agreement? At first it was voluntary, and uh, they were even going to give £4 million to the Czech government, which was... Um, after Hitler marched into Czechoslovakia in March 1939, suddenly decided that was not a very good idea, and they used that money to form the Czech Refugee Trust Fund. So, what, why did they do that if, if they weren't supporting Czechoslovakia before 1938? Tom, can you answer this question? Yeah. yeah. So, we have two questions, or do you I feel... I don't know if I can answer so I will, the question. I will leave both to Tom then. Uh, <coughs> when uh, Chamberlain famously said, and I take your point that uh, Chamberlain had his own issues, uh, but when he said that Czechoslovakia is a faraway country of which we were know, know nothing, he managed to get two things wrong in a single sentence. Uh, Czechoslovakia is not far away, and there was actually a vigorous debate that went right the way through the interwar period about Czechoslovakia. To give you an example, there were well over 100 books published on Czechoslovakia. Uh, the, the school where, where Jakob and myself teach was founded uh, by Tomasz Masaryk and then was given money from the Czechoslovak government through Jan's intervention as well to become an independent institution and was vigorously engaged in public debate. R. W. Seaton Watson, one of the people teaching there at the time, was a public figure making the case for Czechoslovakia. And while uh, Munich agreement was endorsed 
even at the time there were concerns about the consequences of it, including a British government's uh, concerns about what would happen to people who had to flee from the Sudetenland. That's when the fund was originally set up, to deal with those people, Czechs and Jews, fleeing from the Sudetenland, some of whom took refuge in London. The fund was later extended then to include anyone fleeing from the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So, and it was part of a whole series of funds which were established during the war. Uh, the Ledica Fund, uh, funds uh, in solidarity with Czechoslovak students, which led to the creation of International Students Day, and so on and so on, that were part of a real and a vigorous engagement <coughs> with Czechoslovak questions felt by many British people. Uh, elements of the government and elements of British society. Czechoslovakia was not a faraway country of which we knew nothing. It was an actively debated country uh, with views on both sides strongly held and vigorous debates of which uh, your relatives played a part, speaking tours, concerts, uh, newspapers. In fact, the Czechoslovak government in exile immediately started publishing its own newspapers to influence British opinion and there were plenty of columnists. Uh, across the board. And so, uh, so I think the answer to, your, to that particular part of the question is that actually the vigorous debate shaped on both sides, uh, in, guilt from the government perhaps, but also a huge outpouring of public anger at what had happened to Czechs and Slovaks. And that very skillfully uh, uh, managed by by Jan Masaryk to help shape British public opinion and direct it uh, in a particular way that led to the formal renunciation of Munich. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. So with this, I would like to close our debate. Once again, I would like to ask for an applause, not for me, but for our speakers.